Lindsay, welcome to the Organized 365 podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have our conversation together. Can you start by telling everyone how you first found Organize 365? So I found Organize uh, 365 through Angela Watson's uh, Truth for Teachers podcast. I have been a member of her 40-hour program for a while, since about 2019. And when she happened to pop up a podcast episode in the middle of summer of 2022, I was like, this is weird. So let me listen to this and see what she's talking about today. Um, so are you a teacher or were you a teacher? I am. I'm a high school special education teacher. Okay. Well, thank you for your service. I feel like we need to say <laughs> that to teachers now, like we do to the military. <laughs> yeah, some days. <laughs> so you are a high school teacher, you said, right? Mm -hmm. How long have you been a high school teacher? So my path to high school special ed has been an interesting one. Um, I graduated college in 2007, so right before the recession. And in California, there was already a declining enrollment. But my goal was originally to be a middle, no, an elementary school teacher. I eventually uh, ended up in middle school and then high school special education because of job availability. And I've been there for 12 years. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting, the ebbing and flowing of when and where you can get a teaching job. It's like, it's like they need all the teachers or they need no teachers. There's like never usually a middle ground in teaching, I found. Yeah, I knew special education would be safe because there's always a need. But for, you know, I've been there for 12 years because I'm like, I'm fine where I'm at. I'm in a really good school at a really good district and I don't plan on leaving anytime soon. That's awesome. So in addition to yourself, are there any other people that live in your house with you? I have my husband. We've been together for 21 years. We've been married for 10. Wow. Uh, we have three girls. Uh, we have a nine-year-old and five-year-old twins. And wow. we have two cats. Okay. So you have a very full house is what you're saying. <laughs> it's very, very busy. And two of my girls have IEPs. So my background helps a lot. Uh, one of my oldest has a learning disability and one of my twins has autism. Okay. It is, you know, when I created the Warrior Mama Binder, part of what I was doing, like teachers understand that there are services available for kids that are like deviating from the norm, which is all kids really. But, you know, as a teacher, like we're trained in like, what are the averages or what is typical for age development and um, development in general. And so we observe it in our children. And then we also understand the resources that schools do and don't have. And sometimes that medical does and doesn't have that other parents don't, um, know are available. And that's why I created the warrior mama binder. It was because we, as teachers kind of, we almost want to pull these parents aside and say, say this, do this, this is how you, but we can't. Like we can't say those things and you kind of have to figure it out as a parent. So I was just like, Hey, I'm not teaching anymore. So here's, here's what all the teachers want to tell you, say this, do this. You could get uh, more and better services for your kids. It's not about like getting all the services that you possibly can, but a lot of times there are services available that as a parent, you need to advocate for. Totally. And I have the warrior mama, warrior mama binder. I end up getting it at the beginning of the school year. Um, I've had some difficulties with our school district that my girls go to. And so pulling that, I actually pulled that out at an in-person IEP meeting and they were like, wow, you're organized. They go, yes, yes, I am. And I pulled out reports that they didn't have. And because they were talking about different services or different things to look into. I'm like, oh, I've already done that. Look at this. Or I've done this. Look at this. So it's been very helpful. Um, I didn't think I was going to need it because, you know, I know all of the things. I know how the game is played. but I needed it because I was like, I need a place to put all of these papers where I easily access them. And it's been great because I take it even on the Zoom IEP meetings. I have it with me and I'm going through it. And I'm like, nope, at our last IEP, we talked about this. And this was the goal from last time. And so it's been really helpful. And it's not like a stick it to the man type thing or like, I'm going to get my fair share. It's it's the word of mama binder, like even for teachers who know how the game is played, it kind of level sets expectations on both sides of the table, as in like, 
yes, I am the parent. Okay. I'm not in the meetings that you're in and I'm not in the budgetary decisions you're in and I'm not in the hiring decisions of the school, but I am going to advocate for my child for what is fair and equitable and what the law will provide for them. And in order to facilitate that to the best of my ability, I am going to give you the physical paper documentation that you need in order to support my child in the services that you also want to provide. Like, it's not like the school doesn't want to provide them, but they've got like so much legal red tape. And so if you come to the meeting and you intellectually know what the child needs and you're like, hey, we need this or we did this service and you have a verbal conversation about it, there is nothing for that administrator or educator to tangibly take from that meeting to their supervisor or the state board or wherever they need to in order to unlock the funds or the personnel for whatever it is that you're advocating for. Like it's a paper game. <laughs> I don't care if you're digital. This is a paper game. Like we're in a paper game. If you have the paper at the right time, things go faster, you get more because it, it just is. And also those binders scare people. <laughs> they, do. <laughs> they totally do. Yep. They're like, what's in the binder? <laughs> I brought it to a doctor's appointment too. And the doctor's like, okay. I'm like, what do you want to know? Um, yeah, it's it's definitely a game changer. They know, the school knows I have everything. So, and they also, I'm also very upfront. Like, this is what I do. Like, I understand your side of the job because I have that side of the job. So, but at the same time, my daughter needs extra support. This is what we think she needs. And, you know, if they're willing to suggest something, cool. So let's try it out see how it works. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, let's look at something else because, you know, my child does need extra support in the classroom. So, yeah. And if you take it out of the school setting, I just did a presentation on, you know, creating the binders. And I specifically talked about the warrior mama binder at a homeschool convention, full room, men, women, you know, all, you know, mostly homeschooling parents were in the room. And I was explaining that when you have a medical binder or the IEP binder and you go to a new doctor. And specifically, I was talking about like a mental health professional, which would cover autism, ADHD, learning disabilities. All those would be in those like non-testable, uh, like can't do a blood test to figure out if something's going on. We have to do intellectual testing, observations, things like that. They're that not as easily clearly defined. I explained that, you know, and I've told you guys the story before about how I lost it. And I created this like, hi, this is me, this is my child, this is our road that got us to you type paper that was, you know, single spaced, couple pages. And I would hand this to new medical professionals when we had new doctor appointments. And I said, I did this for two reasons. Number one, I was tired of explaining all of my child's deficiencies in front of my child, in front of medical professionals. Like, I don't think that reinforcement is a positive um, thing for children to see. Every time you see a doctor, your mom's going to tell them every single thing in your history that is not typical. That's not great. And secondly, I said, what I think happens is when you hand that paper to a doctor and they're reading it, because when you go to a mental health doctor of any kind, they have to take a mental health assessment. They, mu they must. Like, And so when they're reading that, you move them from an administrative person who is checking off a box that they legally must check off to an analytical doctor who is now reading a story and looking for clues. And when I started doing this, the doctors would usually stop and then they would say to me, okay, I have three more questions. And it's like, I checked off all of their legal requirements and sometimes I gave them more information than they would have asked for. And then they asked me three or four specific things. And then they were ready to start saying, let's test this. Let's try this plan. Let's make this medication modification. So in this talk, a doctor raised their hand and they said, I am a psychiatrist and she is right. And if you guys did that, you would save us so much time and you would get so much better care for your, your family members and yourselves. Because it does, it moves a doctor into analytical doctor mode and out of admin mode. Totally. I remember when we were getting um, my daughter assessed for autism and I knew we had to wait till three and just having all the paperwork from like the school, because we had just gotten her on IEP at age three and all the reports, every piece of paper I could find, I gave to the doctor and she was like, you've given me more stuff than the average parent does. I said, yes, take whatever you need. And um, it was a lot easier to move that diagnosis process a lot faster. 
Yes, I will say that I have one child that has like too many diagnoses, but they're all legitimate diagnoses. And each diagnosis gives you different services, supports, medications. Like we need all of these things to create a big, better picture in order for them to have everything that they need. And yeah, similarly, I would take all of my documentation to different kinds of doctors and be like, how about if you look at this? Because if you take the same exact medical profile to a doctor that specializes in autism, guess what? You will get an autism diagnosis. If you take that to someone who specializes in ADHD, you will get an ADHD diagnosis. If you take that to somebody, because these symptoms, especially under the age of 10, are so similar that it could be a mood disorder and ADHD and autism. Uh, what, like it could be any of those things. We don't really even know at the age of three, but by getting any kind of a diagnosis, it unlocks dollars, special education, mm -hmm. and um, trying things. Because even if you have like cancer, like the treatment they, they prescribe isn't necessarily going to cure your cancer, even if it's the same cancer as the person next to you. Like you have to try different treatments, even in medically blood tested things. So in neurological uh, cases, you're obviously going to have to try more and more therapies. And there are a lot of therapies that work equally well or to some extent for all of those neurodiversities. So you just got to get going because we know as educators, you need to get intervention sooner rather than later. And I'm a huge proponent of early intervention. And my daughter has been in speech since she was two. She's an ABA therapy and it's done tremendous for her because I know, I mean, granted, her sisters are very social and they've taught her a lot of social skills, but she definitely needs that extra intervention to work mm -hmm. on those emotional management skills and flexibility because she's not very flexible. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you for being so open about that. I think that when you have a child that it has a diagnosis that is big and scary, you feel very isolated and alone. And the truth is that one out of every three kids in the United States is diagnosed with ADHD, autism, allergies, or ADHD, four A's, ADHD, autism, allergies, asthma. and asthma. Yeah, that's the other one. And those are all like big diagnoses. They really like allergies isn't like, oh, you know, it's usually like an anaphylactic allergy. It's like you're carrying around an EpiPen going, oh, don't touch that. Don't breathe that. Don't like, what did you just give them? And you are just constantly on this heightened awareness all the time. Like it's hard to relax as a parent when you have a child with one of those diagnoses. And I think for me, because of my, my teaching background, I was afraid that people would think I'm crazy. Um, I'm that I'm projecting my job on my child because I have two mm -hmm. kids with IEPs and I teach students with learning disabilities. So, and it's like, I was always second guessing myself and the uh, developmental pediatrician that diagnosed my daughter with autism was like, you're not crazy. It's mm -hmm. there. You just caught it really, really early. And that really helped me with my anxiety because it's like, okay, I'm not projecting on my kids. There is something there. And the, the same thing with my older daughter. It's like, I know there's something wrong but I know I have to give it time because they won't assess her for an IEP until second grade. So it's, it's given me that, you know, now that I've been through this, it's kind of like, okay, I'm not crazy. Cause sometimes you feel like you're crazy when you're seeing all these issues and you're not sure if they're really there, if they're in your head. So. Well, and I yeah. think it's great that you vocalize that because you are a, a teacher who specializes in special ed instruction and so imagine how much more you think that it's just in your head if you don't have a teaching degree and you don't have a specialty teaching degree in special education, then you think, is this normal? Isn't this normal? Like you don't have a reference for what normal childhood is, especially if you don't have a lot of family and friends that are having children about the same age. Um, something that I learned in my PhD journey, which, you know, I'll be sharing this kind of stuff, is I was doing a, um, I was doing a paper about parent intuition. <laughs> and let me just tell you, I'm doing a PhD the Lisa Woodruff way, which means all of my papers are like the way I talk to you on podcasts, which are not like academic-y. And so <laughs> doing, I can't even remember what the topic was, but I pulled in parent intuition and I was like going to prove that parent intuition is correct. And I did. And so um, didn't prove it, but I supported parent intuition. And what I found was, and I've now used this same journal article in three papers I've written is that in the case of 
pediatric cancer. Parents notice changes in a child's biology and behavior 18 months before blood tests showed cancer. And to the extent that a specific hospital now uses parent intuition and observation as a diagnosis of cancer because the blood markers, and they would, they would keep doing these blood markers and it would not show up and not show up. And 18 months later, the cancer showed up and they're like, these parents are observing cancer in their children before our blood tests are showing that there is cancer. And so if that's true in something that is a blood test, then you should give yourself more credit in the observation of your children if you think that there's something off or you just have this little nagging feeling like, mm, I don't know, but it seems like there's something there. Like follow your gut. I mean, I say follow your gut. What do you say, Lindsay? I totally say follow your gut. I mean, the I have the twins. So one of them has autism. One is completely neurotypical. And they always, doctors always say, don't compare your kids. And I would go to the doctor. I'm like, look, I have a twin who's normal. I don't have a twin who's not. So it's really hard to not compare them and right. not see an issue. Cause it's not like I'm comparing the nine-year-old to the five-year-old. If I yeah. remember what the nine-year-old was like at five, it's like, I've got two kids. They're fraternal. They're not identical. They're completely different. Just born at the same time. And this one is just, there's something going on. So, and I just, yeah. I followed it. And I remember looking at my husband because I noticed it a lot when during the COVID uh, shutdown, we were playing in the backyard and I'm looking, watching her and I'm like, she is on the spectrum. Like there's just something not normal about her. And my husband's like, really? I'm like, oh no, yeah, it's there. We just got to wait and see what pans out. So I'm glad I did that because it's opened up so much for her. And I think before we move off of this topic, just I'll give you a chance to iterate as well. Like this does not mean there's anything wrong with the person or the child. It just means that th there are additional supports needed and strategies that can be used in order to advance the most optimal and conditions for this person to thrive in the world. And they just need some extra supports. It doesn't mean that like, we're just going to put a label on and then we're going to excuse behavior or we're, you know, or we're trying to get a pass. Or like, that's not what we're saying here. We're just saying that sometimes you need, you need extra support. And as parents, we need extra support too. It's like, yes, she needs, she needs the, the social skills therapy. She needs the behavior therapy and we need training even myself because, and my kids don't listen to me. Um, and just learning how to work with her in a different way because the ABA mm -hmm. provides parent training too and so it's like even though I have that background it's like I still need to work look at this from the parent perspective and not necessarily the teacher perspective so it's helped all of us and it's also helped her two sisters to kind of like work with her and not take her outbursts personally um, mm -hmm. when she does have an outburst so it's really helped us all with that early intervention yeah all right, so you found Organize 365 in the summer of 2022 when you were listening to Angela's podcast. Um, so you were, I mean, I'm thinking you're probably a pretty already organized person. Like what did you decide to get organized or what had you tried before and why did you like migrate over into the Organize 365 world? <laughs> so if I was by myself, single, no children, I probably would have never found you because I'm really organized, <laughs> but my girls are tornadoes. And I cannot keep this house straight. And my idea of like organized is like perfection, everything in its place, nothing moves. And so when I was listening to her interview with Angela's interview with you, she talked about the Sunday basket and the Friday work box. And I was intrigued about the Sunday basket just because I have some paper. I don't know where to, what to do with it. We don't have a filing cabinet. It's just in piles in different flight places of the house. So that I... I thought I could get it done perfectly and set up perfectly. And then it, it took me a while because I kept like having to relabel it and try to figure out how to, especially the 2.0s, how to get them to work. So I've actually cleaned out and completely reorganized my Sunday basket a couple of times. Um, and that just has really helped me because if I put things in a pile, I forget it's there. So getting that, having, making myself go through all of the paperwork that comes home or every day or that I put in there has been really helpful. Um, I've, started working on projects now where it's like, okay, we need to replace the tile in the bathroom. We need to work on the backyard in this area. And so I've slashed pockets for that. Um, so it's really helped me with that. And then 
uh, shortly after I got the Sunday basket, I got the Friday work box. So that was really helpful as well. So, yeah. Yes. And so you were getting all of those like to do's that you probably were keeping in your head, but you, um, didn't have place for it. Like often when people think about the Sunday basket, they're like, I don't have paper or there's not that much on the kitchen counter. It's not just like the physical mail, like, okay, maybe you don't get mail in your mailbox, but we do have a lot of actionable things that we do that we either write down on paper or we put in a digital system or worse, we just try to keep it in our head. Yeah, I'm, I'm horrible. I'm like not horrible, but I'm notorious for keeping everything in my brain. Um, and I was just, it, constantly trying to remember stuff I have to do. I was just at Walmart the other day going, oh, I forgot to get this because I forgot to write it down. So, um, but definitely writing the notes, um, putting just reminders in my Sunday basket. And I've also set up my email like the Sunday basket too. So when I go through, I just put everything in my Sunday basket label in Gmail. And then I go through it on Sundays and I categorize it and I'll print out the emails I need to print out. Um, I'll write notes, hey, I need to pay this, and then kind of process it all on Sundays, which has been really helpful for me, because most of my mail is digital, it is email. So mm -hmm. having that same setup in Gmail has been helpful. And I have it both in my personal and our family Gmail accounts. So we're able to kind of like go through, I go through everything on Sundays and, you know, get it taken care of. How long does that take you? Not long. I'm really fast. No? <laughs> I mean, we don't, I'd say about an hour, hour and a half. I mean, we don't, I, I, I go through it pretty quickly and I do it in stages because again, mm -hmm. I have three tornadoes that interrupt me. So I'll, and I usually delete all the junk email as I get through it. I look at it and I delete all the junk stuff right away. And I, the stuff I don't need to deal with, I just file and then in my Sunday basket label, and then I'll go through and I usually delete a bunch of stuff and then but I'm pretty fast. I work pretty fast on my computer. Okay. So I love that you said you're pretty fast. And I also love that you said that you do it in stages because I do both of those things as well. So I love that you said you're pretty fast. And then when you added it up, it was an hour and a half, an hour to 90 minutes, which is how long I say on the average, you know, 90 minutes to three hours is what the Sunday basket is going to take. And you say that's really fast. A lot of people are like, 90 minutes. Are you kidding me? Like I cannot possibly spend that much time thinking about and organizing. Um, so I just want to call that out. Like, like you're obviously very productive and getting a lot done, Lindsay. <laughs> and so spending 90 minutes on the weekend to keep all the balls in the air and keep everything going to you is really fast. And I just want to say to everyone who's listening, like what you think is really fast and what you think is really long is something that you think, and you get to decide what you think. I also think 90 minutes in the Sunday basket is really fast. Like, it's just like the price of admission to keep my life going at the speed I want to have it go at. And then also you mentioned kind of chunking it. I do the same thing. So I would love to, for you to like articulate a little bit what you do, and then I'll share what I do. Okay. Right. So, and I, what I usually do is, um, I go through, I, I have three Sunday baskets I go through because I set up two for my daughters, one for my oldest and two for the one for the twins. And I take everything out and I sort it all and I throw away a bunch of stuff. And then I go through all the paperwork and if anything for my girls that I need to do, I put it in my Sunday basket and I go through all of their um, 1.0 slosh pockets because they have those. And then I kind of just all sort stuff that what needs to go in what slosh pocket. And then I put those away and then I go through everything. And then I usually take a break and I deal with whatever is going on at the moment. And then I come, when I come back, I will go through and I just, I look at what do I need to do? I, I use that planning sheet the, with the four boxes. What do I need to do? What errands need to be done or where we're going that week? Cause you know, they're in swim and dance and ice skating and everything. So I, I always write that down. And then um, I just kind of look at overall and I compare it to our, our Google calendar. And I look, okay, Where's the overlap? Um, are there any conflicts? And I look at my work calendar too, especially if there's like a doctor's appointment or something. And I'm looking at everything just to make sure it, nothing's overlapping. And then um, I'll usually put everything in the 1.0s and then I deal with those a different day. So like, you know, I might make all the phone calls on a Monday or Tuesday at work. Um, my errands are usually done on Thursdays when I take uh, my daughter to speech. And I usually run to Walmart and do pick up anything I need to do there. 
Um, so I try to kind of loosely plan out what I'm doing when, but after I'm done with the Sunday basket, I'll usually sit down and go, what can I take care of like right now? And that's usually like paying any bills or answering any emails or just anything that takes like less than a minute to take care of. I try to do all in one sitting. But it's broken up because you just have to make dinner and then I have to go do this and do that. So there are breaks in it, if that makes sense. I love it. It's kind of like laundry. It, but yeah, it's like you get all like laundry and you start a load and then you move it and then you move it and then you fold it. It's kind of like you're doing the Sunday, Sunday basket like laundry. Yeah, pretty much. It's a constant moving, doing something different because I mean, I'm constantly interrupted by someone eating something. So it's okay. Everyone is going to want to know and I want to know. What are in the girls' Sunday baskets and how have you labeled their 1.0s? So for my oldest daughter, it's labeled Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then the last one is the weekend, Friday through Sunday. And with my oldest daughter, I'm trying to teach her how to take her big homework packet that she gets on Fridays and pace it out, spread it out throughout the week. And I also have little note cards and they're saying online math program, online reading program, the other online math program read a book, practice your sight words, and just kind of, so she just takes that day and that's all she has to do. And she also has a one pink slash pocket with her stuff that she wants to keep. And then a blue one for any sort of homework chart because she needs like a multiplication table, number line, all that. So she knows she grabs that, goes to her table, does her homework. Um, The twins, they have one that's labeled Monday through Friday as well. Um, And there's just sight words practice in there, um, just different activities, mostly for ABA when my daughter has ABA therapy. So they have table work to do. And also I have in there, their login for their online programs for school. So it's just very basic. Like they can just take it, they can do whatever's in there, put it back. This is genius. This is genius, Lindsay. You are brilliant. Oh my goodness. And do the girls like having a Sunday basket? Like usually girls want what their moms have. Like uh, my oldest does. She likes having yeah. it. She likes so I, I'm trying to train her to put all of her papers in there and yes. then I'll sort through or she'll help me sort through it. She's um she's one that wants to keep everything. Every scrap of paper she's written a line on, she wants to keep. And I'm like, let's kind of weed this out a little bit. Uh the twins, they they don't. They're five. I love it. But it's okay. just for me. It's more this, for me than them. Because I've been trying to set one up for my daughter Abby. Like, and it's not working because like, I put stuff in there and she's like, I don't know where it is. And then she takes papers and put them. I don't know where she puts them. So I love this idea of the Monday through Friday, because often on the weekend, like little baby Grayson will need stuff. And I have the insurance paperwork or she needs to remember this thing. And I'm always pulling stuff out of my Sunday basket and giving it to her like she's still in high school, but she's not. She's a grown woman with a baby. Like She needs to do her own Sunday basket. And I need to have a place to put that. Um, so you've just given me a great idea. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> there are gonna be all these little baby Sunday baskets everywhere because of you, Lindsay. Hey, whatever works. Okay. So, that's, so awesome. that's something I'm gonna say I got from your interview that I'm gonna uh put into place. But what is the first time that you noticed something was organized that wasn't organized before when you were working with organized 365 products? There's so many little moments. Um so I, I have, I'm a member of the Productive Home Solution and I tried to do my own version before I officially joined. And the reason why I joined is even though I'm really organized um, is like m- what your idea of productivity is. And so when I joined, I'd already decluttered most of my house and I had, was gonna start in the kitchen. So this was in the fall and I was like, you know, I'm just gonna do the kitchen with the Productive Home Solution. And so the biggest aha moment was the drink station I was like, I never thought of this. This is amazing. And so setting that up led me to completely rearranging my entire kitchen. And that (laughs) led to creating a baking station and a food prep station. Um, I live in a small house. Uh, Our dining area of our house is, I've made an extension of our kitchen. So I have a little island in there. And so just creating these different stations. And the first time I made coffee in our new drink station where I didn't have to walk across the kitchen was amazing. I was like, if it's all right here, this is awesome. Okay. You are like a wealth of ideas. Explain the, so I'm imagining you have a dining room that you're not using as a dining room and you put an Island in there. And like, maybe did you build out like, like, are you the one in the app that has the like pantry? Where did I see a pantry in the dining room? Maybe it was on Instagram. I don't know. 
They used so no, I have a, to like create a really big pantry. Maybe it was on no, that Instagram. Wasn't I saw it. I don't know. No, I have a very small kitchen and it's a small little gala kitchen with a little dining dinette area. It's all like mm. one big rectangle and you might be able to fit a small round table where the dining table is supposed to go, but it's real tiny. And we got this kitchen island after our wedding, but it's always been pushed against the wall because we have a big bonus room that was added on in the back of the house. That's about half the size of the house. And that's where our dining table is. It's our dining living room area. And so we had this empty space I didn't know what to do with. So what I did during COVID is I pulled the island in the middle of this dinette space. Um, But I just had a bunch of random stuff in the shelves and the drawers. So um, when I reorganized my kitchen, I actually made that an official part of the kitchen. So I have this little island that is movable. And then I have books. I have some shelves that I have my cookbooks on. Um, and I have a little dresser that my dad made shelves for, for all, all the cat stuff and some of our um, lunch boxes and stuff are there. So it's just like an extension of the kitchen. I love it. I love it. Cause yeah. otherwise you weren't using that space. Mm-mm, there's just a big walkthrough to the backyard. Great. That's so awesome. I oh, cannot wait to find out what else I'm going to learn in this interview. Um, Okay, so is there any other story that you want to share about your organizational journey? So with the the Friday Workbox um, has been awesome. It's been amazing for me because I write IEPs. And so uh, Angela's program is amazing, like streamlining your teaching. But teaching is half of my job. The other half is administrative work. And again, I thought I could set it up perfectly the first time. And I ended up completely redoing all of my slosh buckets. And I just actually redid my... um, one point knows the other week, but I have all of my purple two point knows are for IEP writing. And it's amazing. It's nice to have like one slash pocket for the resources I use to write IEPs, one to keep all student information in that I need. And it's just, you know, it's all there. It's all visual. Um, I'm the person that my department chair comes to. He's like, do you have this paper? And I usually go, here's slash pockets right here. <laughs> I'm his go-to person. So it's pretty awesome to have that. And it's all like there, it's all pretty. I've had people go, wow, what is that? And I go, let me tell you about the Friday work box. And did you, um, what was your process like before? Because obviously you, I'm sure you've always been very good at writing IEPs. Like this doesn't make you, I always say that the education work box or the business Friday work box doesn't make you better at your job. It just makes the administration portion of your job visible and then allows you to create better checklists so that you can do it faster and easier. But we don't help you become a teacher. You're already a great teacher. So how, what was the process like of writing the IEPs before you were using the education work box? So I would have these like stacking trays on my mm-hmm. desk at work mm-hmm. and I'd put papers there and I forget they're there because I'm very visual. If I don't see it, it's, it yeah. ceases to exist. So I would find like uh, surveys or evals for students from our psychologists and I would forget they're there. I'm like, oh, so I got into this habit of having to do everything right away or I was going to forget to do it. Okay. So then I became known of getting things done right away. And it's like, I've got to slow down and realize not everything is a fire and not everything has to be done right away. And so having a place to put it, I go, do I have to do this now? And they're like, oh no, do it next week. Okay, work box. And then going through it every Friday morning, because that's usually when I do it, I go through it and I'm like, oh yeah, let me fill this out really quick. Or let me put this in a, I'll do this on Wednesday while I'm during my prep period. So I'll put that in that slosh bucket. And so that has really helped me slow down in that aspect where I'm not mm-hmm. treating everything like it's an emergency and then spreading it out throughout the week. So now I'm at a point where, um, I'm actually ahead on a lot of my IEPs because I have them all organized in a slash pocket. I already have the ch- uh, checklist. They're already filled out and they're in order. And usually I'm sitting there sometimes like twiddling my thumbs going, okay, what am I going to do now? Because I already have everything either prepped way ahead of time, or um, I already know when I'm going to do my grading or when I'm going to do this. So now I have time to really sit and think, what am, what is my next step? What am I going to do next? So it's that okay, increase. Of that sounds like work. a fairy tale to almost everybody who's listening, but it is, I find, I mean, today already, and I'm doing a PhD also. And I'm like, okay, I have time. How do I need to use this time? I'm like, I don't have anything for this time. Like it is amazing that when you make the invisible work visible, and then you 
eliminate what you don't need to do and automate and create checklists for what you do need to do. Like the work just gets done so much faster, so much more efficiently. And then do you also notice, this is something I noticed now that I'm working on my papers, like the week before they're due, I am not necessarily writing the paper, but I'll look at what the assignment is. Sometimes I'll go and I'll get the articles that I need for the assignment and I'll be thinking about it as I'm driving. And then when I sit down to write that paper, I have so many more of my thoughts already congealed together or like you already have some of your IEPs almost done before they need to be done. And then you have a session with that child or you listen to a podcast. So you think about something like, oh, that's an intervention we can use with that child on that IEP or, oh, look, they, they gained another skill right before the IEP or, oh, they're actually having trouble with this skill. And so I'm going to actually add that to my observations. Whereas in the past, you're either doing it right before. So you're just trying to remember, or you're doing it right as you receive it. Again, either way, you're not giving your, your brain and your eyes the time to actually like work with you, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's um yeah, having that headspace has allowed me to really think about improving lesson planning, improve, you know, I we're working on a textbook adoption for I'm a course lead for I teach modified science, so I'm the course lead. And so being able to push through uh this textbook adoption, um, I've been tagged in to do some teacher training in my district. So I have the time to like prep that and get that going. Um, and it's just given me opportunities to pursue other things in my district and even outside. I'm looking into, I'm starting teacher training with a nonprofit organization. So I'm like, okay, so I have time to think about doing this and I have time to do this. And um, it's really nice to have that um, ability to think about all of that without having to worry about the day-to-day -day stuff of my normal job. So we're about 18 months from when you first found Organize 365. That's a pretty, pretty fast transition from finding Organize 365 to having the amount of change that you already are exhibiting. But I think it's probably because you already were an organized person. Life just got moving too fast. And then these new systems helped you pick back up where you were before. Would you say that that's accurate or how would, how would you describe it? Because not everyone's going to have results that quickly. Um, I think it's allowed me to finding organized 365 when I did allowed me not to hit rock bottom in that sense where life completely ran me over. I was getting to a point where it's like, okay, I can't keep up. So I need mm. something to help prop me up because I was heading to that point of, I didn't want to get, you know, just hitting rock bottom and feeling like I got ran over. So um, at work, it, it wasn't an issue. It was more fine tuning everything that I do already do and making it better. But at home, it was more of, I need an, I need a system that is, has enough structure where I can jump off of it, but enough flexibility where I feel like I, if I don't keep it exactly, then I fail because mm -hmm. I'm like, I want that, you know, I want that A plus. <laughs> and, um, so having the system like, it's okay if you change it. It's okay. If you relabel your slash pockets, it's okay. If you do this differently. It's like, oh, I can do that. Okay. That's good. Cause I needed, I need to adjust it to work for my family. Yeah. So it, just having that system was really important. What do you think you have more of now? Um, I have more, I want to say more time, but it's not a quantifiable time. It's more of a time. Uh, it's more time for me to think about what I want to do. Um, I started crocheting an Afghan got back into crocheting. Uh, I started a Bible study and these were, you know, developing these hobbies are things that I didn't think I would have time for, but I'm able to find that headspace where it's like, no, I can do this. I can join this group. I can work on this project. Um, so it's more of that time for myself that I'm making myself carve out for. And I'm able to focus on what I need because I'm taking care of, you know, three kids and two cats and and working full time. So it doesn't seem like a lot until you talk, talk about it. And then you're like, oh, I am dealing with a lot. Yeah, you are doing a lot. How does it feel to have time for yourself during the school year? It feels great. Um, it feels weird. Yes. I'm not used to it. I'm not used to it. So it feels really nice to 
be able to like, no, I am going to go do yoga. You're not going to bug me. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to work on this Afghan or I'm going to, you know, sit down and read this book. So, I mean, having this time would have been nearly impossible when the twins were younger, but now that Mm -hmm. they're older, they're more self-sufficient. It's like, okay, now I think I can start taking some of that time back for me. And it's been great. Have you thought at all about um, summer and what summer will look like this year? Yes. So I'm teaching summer school, but only half okay. of it. We are going on a vacation. Um, we will have childcare. Um, usually it's my mom or my mother-in-law watches the girls. And then after that, we're just planning on um, just doing different activities. We have a membership to our aquarium in Long Beach and we'll go there. We'll go to the park. We like to go to the pool. So I like to keep them busy, but not too busy because then my daughter with autism gets overwhelmed. So yeah. Yeah. Nice. A lot. (laughs) So is there anything you wish you had known sooner? Um, you existed. (laughs) You were here. I wish I would have found you so much earlier. Um, that I don't have to be perfect. And that's hard for me to realize because um, I am a perfectionist and that getting organized doesn't have to be complicated, mm-hmm. that it can be simple. So, and there's different ways of doing it. It doesn't have to be one way or that's it. Mm-hmm. So what would you say to people They're They've just found Organized 365 recently, or maybe this is their very first podcast episode. What would you say to them? I would say, you know, just jump in and try it. It doesn't have to be perfect right off the bat. You can, you can make it what you need it to be for that moment. And you just need to see some progress. Every pro- every small amount of progress is progress. So as long as you see some improvement, that's what's important. Yeah. I like to say you cannot possibly be behind when you're getting organized, like everything, mm-hmm. everything that you're doing cumulatively works towards becoming more and more organized and more productive. Lindsay, this was such a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the Wednesday podcast. Thank you for having me.